Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. So there's been a lot of talk these days about racism. And rightly so, as the old saying goes, the first step to overcoming a problem is admitting that there is one. Now, I've been following a lot of the commentary specifically regarding racism in Ireland because I feel as though I can have more of an impact on that. And if you've been following this too, you'll notice a trend appearing when it comes to the responses. Whenever somebody puts up a tweet or a Facebook post or anything like that saying that there is racism in Ireland, there are five different responses that they usually get. The first one being, I agree, straightforward. The second, simply saying, no there isn't, you're wrong. The third is normally doing something awful like calling the person the n-word or saying that there's no such thing as black Irish, which is not only horrible and wrong but also... 100% supportive of the original post, but even so. So that's three. The final two I want to talk about are basically different ways of phrasing the same argument. And I'll explain that in a second. One of these I genuinely believe is simply just born out of a lack of historical knowledge and learned from memes on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. But I do, I do think that these people have their heart in the right place. They're just not saying the right thing. The other way of phrasing this is basically just a way of downplaying the horrors inflicted upon Africans throughout history. The argument is roughly this. Somebody says, there's racism in Ireland. And they get a response saying, you're right, there is. And I understand what you're going through. As an Irish person, we were also slaves. So I can sympathise. Or, forget about your slavery, what about my slavery? I'm Irish, the Irish were slaves. When are people going to start caring about us? Or any of the numerous variations of the post which I'm throwing up on screen now. So what I'd like to do today is a few things. Uh, One, I'd like to look at what indentured servitude is, why people were willing to do it, and the Differences between indentured servitude and what I'll call actual slavery, chattel slavery. I'd then like to look at some of these memes which are constantly being shared on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm going to debunk them because, on a whole, they're completely false. And then finally, I'd like to look at this idea of the Irish as slaves. Like, what it actually was, and the treatment of Irish people, as well as how indentured servitude kind of worked. By the end of this video, I'm hoping to show you that a lot of what you see online is not only just not accurate, but it's actually a way of suppressing the legitimate concerns of non-white people about racism in Ireland and abroad, to be honest, because I'm seeing a lot of plastic patties using these arguments as well. Alright, so with that, let's, let's get cracking. Part 1. Where are the Irish slaves? No. Part two. Though, okay, 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 I will go into it more. This is a very heavy topic. I just wanted to start with a bit of levity. Everyone calm down. Part one. We're the Irish slaves, but for real this time. So I wasn't entirely lying during the last joke. They weren't slaves. The Irish were indentured servants, bought to work in the fields and homes of landowners or masters, which sounds the same initially, but I can assure you it is not. There are plenty of differences between indentured servitude and slavery, but there are a few key differences between indentured servitude and chattel slavery, which is the type of slavery Africans were subjected to, which really show that they're not the same thing. The first distinction is humanity. Those who were indentured servants were human, which sounds incredibly basic. But those who were abducted from Africa and sold into chattel slavery were not deemed human. They were, they were tools. They were commodities. And I want you to hold on to those two words, abducted and commodities. We will be coming back to those in a moment, and you'll see why I use them. The second difference is time. Chattel slavery was not only permanent, but multi-generational. Not only were you a slave for life, but your children were slaves for life, and their children were slaves for life, and so on and so on, forever. Endangered servitude was different. It was not permanent. You worked for a period of between four and ten years, depending on why you got into it, and then you were a free man. 
But more importantly than that, if you had children while you were in servitude, assuming you were given permission to, they were free men and women too. The third difference is choice. The word abducted was used purposely a few moments ago. Those in indentured servitude chose to enter it. On a whole, there were prisoners who were sent to work in indentured servitude, both political and criminal prisoners. Again, though, once that sentence was served, they were free. Although this is assuming that was possible, there are quite a few examples of prisoners being shipped off to be indentured servants, specifically so they would be worked to death. This was probably done so as to not raise too much anger back in the homelands, essentially, by directly putting them to death. And again, how much of a choice it actually was is a different question and is something which could be debated. According to Hilary Beckles, quote, the Irish poor were more willing to seek opportunities in the West Indies than their English, Scottish or Welsh counterparts, owing to the frequent food shortages, high unemployment and English military disruption in Ireland, end quote. Now, considering that all these issues were caused by English occupation in the first place, This might not have left much of a choice, but the choice was there nonetheless. I'm also not sure that I agree with the argument stating that the Irish were offered one thing and then received another when they actually arrived in the lands. Beckles goes on to say, quote, It is unlikely that Irish emigrants believed that working conditions and social relations on English plantations would be as agreeable as the merchants suggested though they must have accepted how the general point that the West Indies offered levels of opportunity for betterment that were inconceivable at home, end quote. Which is common sense, really. I mean, if you're occupied by the English and then an English merchant comes along and says, ah, here's this great opportunity, you should take it, everything's rosy, don't question it, it's fine, trust me, everything will be good, you're going to be a little bit suspicious, right? It's going to be a touch of scepticism there. So why did they accept these offers? What is it about indentured servitude that made it tempting in the first place? Well, in return for four to ten years of contracted labour, those who signed up would receive not only the cost of their transport, they would also receive food, clothing and shelter on the plantations. And again, the quality of this is a separate question, but it was there. The agreement that all this was guaranteed was something in no way afforded the chattel slaves. After you'd finished as an indentured servant and served at the time of your contract, planters were legally bound to provide the servant with freedom dues, which was a piece of land and then either a sum of money or objects or commodities worth the same amount as that sum of money. Objects or commodities. Commodities such as slaves. There are a lot of examples of Irish being directly involved in the Atlantic slave trade. That's not what this video is about. I'm not really going to go into it. You can look into it yourself. I would, first of all, recommend the article by Nini Rogers in History Ireland. I'll pop the link in the description. The article's called The Irish and the Atlantic Slave Trade, and in it she states, quote, Every group in Ireland produced merchants who benefited from the slave trade and the expanding slave colonies, end quote. So in a nutshell, That is what indentured servitude was. I will be going into more detail later. I just wanted to give you a very high-level view of what it was and why people would have wanted to get involved in the first place and to also show you the nuances that need to be thought about when making this argument. All right, let's look at some of these shit-ass memes. Part 2. Those shit-ass memes. Alright, the first thing I'm going to say is I am very sorry for the eye abuse that I'm about to bestow upon you. These are the ugliest memes I've ever seen, and I follow Cursed Boomer memes on Reddit, so I kind of know what I'm talking about here. Alright, let's get the first one up. Okay, this one... The the top title says to remember Irish slaves, even though the article itself calls them indentured servants. Even people at the time knew there was a difference. I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be commenting on here, to be honest. This is a bad example. I, I do love that toxic waste green color that was used, though. That's, that, that's quite nice. All right, let's get the next one up. Oh, this one. Okay, there's a lot going on in this one. Um, I'm going to start with the text. First of all, those monetary amounts are made up. They are literally plucked from the arse of whoever put this meme together. Uh, I can find no evidence of costing. In saying that... It is common sense that indentured servants were cheaper. 
I mean, you're paying for between four and ten years of intense labour, but that's all. Chattel slaves were permanent, multi-generational, so of course they'd cost more. This second section reads, quote, They could be worked to death, whipped or branded without it being a crime. Many times they were beat to death, and while the death of an Irish slave was a monetary setback, it was far cheaper than the death of an expensive African. End quote. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, I want you to look at the image. What do you see there? Well, you see some very tasteful side boob, yes, but that's not what I'm talking about. You see a woman wearing black whipping another woman, right? If you look below the image, you'll see the words Mother Brownrig flogging her apprentice in the cellar. Do you see that? You're, you're, probably, you're probably still looking at the side boob. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to continue on. And if you miss out and don't learn anything because you're staring at side boob, that's, that's on you, not on me. So it was actually illegal to overly abuse your servant. We'll be touching on this later. And doing so would result in punishment. And, oh boy, do I have the best example for you. A woman was put to death in September 1767 for killing one of her servants. The servant's name was Mary Clifford, by the way. Mary died due to cumulative injuries from the abuse of her master. Mary's master was Mother Elizabeth Brownrigg, And the main reason why I chose this specific example is because I don't understand why you would make a meme with an image that directly contradicts the bullshit you're putting forward. What is going on? This is so, um, this is amateur hour here. What the hell are you doing? Why would you choose this? You have so many images of people just getting beaten. Why would you choose this one? Ah. Also, this last part is just super gross and racist, so I'm going to move on. Oh, Jesus, where to even begin with this one? There's so much going on. This is going to take a few minutes to get through, but there's a lot in this, and I specifically chose this one because it does actually have a lot of the points I've seen in many other memes, and I decided just go through one big one that has everything as opposed to lots of little ones. The first thing I want to point out with this is actually how amazingly angry that little girl on the right-hand side of the image is. It's hilarious. Like, look at her. Look at her face. You could never be that angry. Also, this is actually a picture of a group of girls who were working in South Carolina as oyster shuckers in the early 1900s. Here's the proof. Okay. So I'm going to start now with the text on the left-hand side of the image first, and I'm going to take this in, in two parts. The first sentence reads, quote, The first slaves imported into American colonies were 100 white children in 1619, four months before the arrival of the... F- no, no, hang on, sorry. Four months before the arrival of A, the first shipment of black slaves, end quote. The first slaves were, shockingly, not 100 white children. According to John Rolfe, who was a landowner in 1619 and who was, you know, there, Quote, about the latter end of August, a Dutch man of war of the burden of 160 tons arrived at Point Comfort. He brought not anything but 20 and odd slaves, which the governor and Cape Merchant bought for victuals, end quote. Victuals, by the way, is apparently a word for food fit for human consumption. I didn't know that. We're learning. We're all learning together. So where did these 100 white children come from? That sounds incredibly dodgy. I'll just go on. Well, there's no evidence for them. From the same diary entry, John Rolfe wrote this. Oh, God, look at this spelling. Quote, Upon the 4th of November, the Bonanua arrived at James City. All passengers came lusty and in good health. They came by the West Indies, which passage that season doth much refresh the people. (laughs) I'm sure it did. The proportions of victuals brought for those 100 men fell so short that Captain Weldon and Mr. Whittaker's were forced, notwithstanding our plenty, to put out 50 or thereabouts for a year by the governor's and council's advice, for whom they are to rescue... Rescue? Receive? The next year. Three barrels of corn and 55 ends of tobacco for a man which their sickness considered, for seldom any escapeth little or much, is more than they of themselves could ever get. 
By this means, the next year, they will be instructed to proceed in their own business and be well instructed to teach newcomers. End quote. According to the person who was literally there, there was not 100 white children, but about 50 men from the West Indies who would be there for a year, at which point they'd seemingly be getting a sweet promotion and training the other 50 who would be arriving the following year. The second sentence on the left reads, quote, Many were brought from Ireland where the law held that it was, sub quote, no more a sin to kill an Irishman than a dog or any other brute, end quote and sub quote. Okay, this is so extraordinarily out of context. I don't even know where to begin, and even knowing that what I'm about to say is right, I still can't believe how out of context this is. So this line, no more a sin to kill an Irishman than a dog or any other brute, is not taken from the 1600s, nor was it taken from any law. It's taken from a meeting that a man named Donal O'Neill had with Pope John XXII. Donal is telling the Pope that there are Christian laymen and clergymen who espouse ideas that it is no more a sin to kill an Irishman than a dog or any other brute. Not that anyone has actually said that, and not that it is a law. Also, Pope John the Twenty Second reigned from 1316 to 1334, 300 years before indentured servitude with the Irish even happened. I'm willing to give people a leeway of maybe a couple of years? In the 50s, this person said this. You don't need the real, but 300 years seems a, seems a bit much. And this kind of misleading representation of information is something which you will see a lot of as we continue to go through these memes. 300 years, though, I mean, for fuck's sake, come on. Oh, God, there's so much going on in this meme. It's awful to look at. Oh, God, this is horrible. Okay, okay. Let's go to the text on the right. Quote, King James II, followed by Charles I and Oliver Cromwell, sold over 500,000 Irish Catholics into slavery throughout the 1600s onto plantations in the West Indies islands of Antigua, Montserrat, Jamaica, and Barbados, as well as Virginia and New England. End quote. I'm ending the quote there because I've, I've already gone through the second sentence and I'm not going to go through it again, so I hope that's okay. So, King James II, followed by Charles I and Oliver Cromwell. King James II was born in 1633, and was made king in 1685. I am not entirely sure how Charles I or Oliver Cromwell would have followed up on his orders, considering that they had both been dead for at least 20 years. I'm going to assume they mean James I here, and I'm giving them a huge benefit of the doubt. E even so, this this has already started terribly. Uh, they've mixed up two completely different arse sorry, not arseholes, uh, monarchs, that's the word, whose reigns began over 80 years apart. Also, I'm pretty sure James I was the one who Guy Fawkes tried to blow up. I could be wrong about that, I haven't looked into it, but like, I don't think he's just like some monarch who didn't really do anything. I think he's a pretty big deal. So, we're going to assume James I, followed by Charles I, and then Cromwell. 500,000 people, half a million Catholics. That's, that's a lot of Catholics. That's a, that's a fair handful of Catholics right there. According to the historian Andy Bielenberg, via the amazing Liam Hogan, who everyone should know, love, and cherish. Quote, the total migration from Ireland to the West Indies for the entire 17th century is estimated to have been around 50,000 people, and the total migration from Ireland to the British North America and West Indies is estimated to have been circa 165,000 between 1630 and 1775. End quote. So we're looking over a longer period of time and taking in more reasons for the movement of people from Ireland to America and the West Indies and the actual number is still less than one-third of what this meme is claiming. 500,000 is wrong, and much like the costings in the earlier meme, is just plucked from the arse of the person who made this meme. Okay, so let's move on to the statement at the bottom of this piece of burning garbage. Quote, In the 17th century, from 1600 to 1699, there were many more Irish sold as slaves than Africans. There are records of Irish slaves well into the 18th century. Many never made it off the ships. According to written record, in at least one incident, 132 slaves, men, women, and children, were dumped overboard to drown because ships' supplies were running... The ships... The ships' supplies were running low. They were drowned because the insurance would pay for an 
accident, but none of the slaves were allowed to starve, end quote. So this first line is false for numerous reasons. First of all, based on the fact that it assumes indentured servitude and chattel slavery are the same thing. Now, if I'm going to be extraordinarily generous, I can change the wording of this so that it says that there were more Irish who entered indentured servitude than there were Africans taken as slaves in the 17th century. That is still, that is still wrong, though. That is still wrong. Considering the fact that the first slave ship arrived in 1619, there's already about a fifth of this century where the number of Irish people would have been greater. However, by the mid-17th century, the British economy was doing better, and more and more landowners could afford slaves. According to Robin Blackburn, in 1638, the population of Barbados was around 6,000, with 2,000 of that number being indentured servants, 200 of those being African slaves. Fifteen years later, though, by around 1650, the island's slave population had grown to 20,000, while indentured servants numbered around 8,000. By 1660, according to Betty Wood, there were 26,200 Europeans on the island, that is, white people, no matter what their status was. The number of African slaves on the island at the same time numbered 27,100. So yeah, there is a small period of time when bringing in indentured servants was a stopgap. They were brought in because they were cheaper than African slaves, than shallow slaves. And all that needed to be done was have enough work done on the plantations so that the owners could afford to buy permanent slaves. This was not a conscious choice to bring in Irish people to punish them. This was an economic choice, which was temporary. Quote, there are records of Irish slaves well into the 18th century. End quote. I mean... And this meme has already equated indentured servitude with slavery, so I'm not going to get too hung up on this line. I simply want to say that saying that a thing happened centuries ago is not really a way of making a point. Quote, Many never made it off the ships. According to written record, in at least one incident, 132 slaves, men, women, and children were dumped overboard to drown because the ship's supplies were running low. They were drowned because the insurance would pay for an accident, but not if the slaves were allowed to starve. End quote. This is the most deliberately misleading statement I think I may have ever come across. When reading this, you assume that the statement is saying that 132 Irish slaves were thrown overboard, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the message that this statement is putting across. But what this actually refers to is what's known as the Zong Massacre, which happened on the 29th of November, 1781. The victims of this massacre, which numbers somewhere between 130 and 140, were African slaves. But Paul, you don't even know what the accurate number is. I'm calling bullshit. How do we know they weren't Irish slaves? Well, mysterious arsehole, I'm going to ask you a question. Would you like to let me know why the solicitor representing the captain and crew of the Zong, Mr. John Lee, said the following, quote, What is this claim that human people have been thrown overboard? This is a case of chattels or goods. Blacks are goods and property. It is madness to accuse these well-serving, honorable men of murder. They acted out of necessity and in the most appropriate manner for the cause. The late Captain Collingwood acted in the interests of his ship to protect the safety of his crew. To question the judgment of an experienced, well-travelled captain held in the highest regard is one of folly, especially when talking of slaves. This case is the same as if wood had been thrown overboard. End quote. I'll, I'll await your response in the comments. Oh, by the way, uh, Captain Collingwood, he died before the verdict of this trial was announced, during the trial itself, and he was actually found guilty. But, in classic fashion, he wasn't actually on trial for murder or genocide. He was on trial for insurance fraud. Part 3. The Problems with Indentured Servitude So, life was tough for indentured servants. I'm not going to make any claims that it wasn't. It was awful, cruel treatment that they received most of the time. And if you think that I've been saying anything different throughout this video... I think you've misunderstood, but if I have been implying that, 
I'm going to make sure to correct that in this next section. So ignoring for the moment the actual work itself and the living conditions, which is a lot to ignore, I know, but bear with me, the trip itself to the destination was treacherous. Quote, one ship which arrived at Barbados in 1638 had lost 80 of its 350 passengers to sickness by the time it had arrived. As I mentioned earlier, most of the Irish who became indentured servants did so voluntarily due to the poor quality of life for a majority of Irish people, which again was because of English occupation, there would have been a lot of room for exploitation of Irish workers. Even though indentured servants were entitled to provisions, like I mentioned, food, clothing and shelter, it's very likely that after spending weeks on a boat and coming from, I guess what I can call, a provisions-depleted society, they might not necessarily have been given as much as they were actually entitled to. And coming from somewhere with such a poor quality of life and basically having feck all while on a boat, they probably didn't notice. And this seems to be evidenced by the fact that the Irish kept coming. And in large numbers too. In 1667, Governor William Willoughby reported that over half of his 4,000 man militia in Barbados were Irish. He pleaded for anyone other than more Irish to be sent, saying, quote, I am for the downright Scot who, I am certain, will fight without a crucifix around his neck, end quote. The Irish were, unsurprisingly, quote, loathed by their English masters, end quote. And because of this, there's no doubt that the Irish were mistreated. Even though there were laws in place to try and prevent excessive abuse or exploitation, these were very soft laws. And as if things weren't bad enough, complaints were investigated by constables and justices of the peace who are also landowners. So they're going to look after their own interests as much as possible. Treatment of servants which did not result in physical injury was accepted. When I first read this, physical injury meant cuts, bruises, bleeding. No, 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 no. Physical injury is seen as something which would prevent a servant's ability to work. Let me give you an example. In December 1656, Patrick Cornelius brought a case against his landowner. He said that he had been punished so badly that he could no longer perform his duties. A medical exam of Patrick revealed that he had completely lost the use of his left leg. Patrick Cornelius was released from his contract and declared a free man. So there you go. The system works. Mm, mm, Does it though? Not really. Simply because a decision was reached doesn't mean that it was accepted. Also, in December 1656, an Irish servant called Daniel Duncombe petitioned to the magistrate that he had not been paid his freedom dues as per his contract. His master, Captain John Simmons, was a prominent planter and he basically just refused to pay. The magistrate ruled in favour of Duncombe and ordered Simmons to pay. He just said no. The case then went to the governor, who also found in Duncombe's favour and again ordered Simmons to pay. Not only did Simmons refuse to pay, he found Duncombe in his home and beat him for having the audacity to bring a case against him. And, as is still the case today, the greed and refusal to pay their dues by the rich was bailed out by the public. Duncombe eventually received his payment and it was taken directly from the public treasury. While the Irish were loathed by their English masters, the feeling was unsurprisingly mutual. Many of the Irish had accepted indentured servitude looking for a better life, but they still fully understood what the English were doing back home. An example of this is the case of Cornelius Bryan, different Cornelius from the guy earlier, who was an Irish servant who was sentenced to 21 lashes on the bare skin of his back in January 1656 for refusing to eat a tray of cooked meat which was given to him by his English master. Cornelius Bryan is reported to have said, quote, If there was so much English blood on the tray as there was meat, I would eat it all happily. End quote. Which is simply one of the most badass things I have ever heard in my entire life. But even after they saw out their contracts, they were still second class citizens. Even though they were free men and women, they were not really free. In 1657, Governor Daniel Searle implemented new laws to crack down on the Irish living as, quote, vagabonds refusing to labour or put themselves into any service but contriving in a dissolute, lewd and slothful kind of life, end quote. Governor Searle adopted a short-lived four-point law system. 
One of these laws stated that Irish free men or women bound on the island who could not give a good account of themselves were to be, quote, put to labour for one whole year on some plantation, end quote. Some plantation. Just feck them off anywhere. Now, these laws only lasted about two weeks and I couldn't find any evidence that they were actually enacted or implemented and they were scrapped because it became a hassle to enforce. And also because the English themselves saw the laws as inhumane. Imagine that. These laws were scrapped because they didn't treat the Irish, who, let's not forget, people are saying were treated worse than chattel slaves. These laws were scrapped because they didn't treat them fairly enough. And again, I feel the need to point out that this is not me saying that indentured servitude was okay. The treatment of Irish people was awful. It's certainly not something which would be allowed today. Unless, of course, you're building football stadiums for a World Cup. Then it's totally fine. Fuck it. Go for it. But having said that, the servitude awful part, not the World Cup part, there was another group in these colonies who were treated worse than the Irish. In fact, it's probably because of their presence that the Irish were still treated as human beings. I'm not going to go into the treatment of African slaves in the colonies. It's really not my place to do so. There are black journalists, historians, essayists who deserve to be listened to. There are loads of TED Talks if you don't have much free time. Uh, There's also the amazing documentary 13th, which isn't necessarily just about slavery. It starts off about slavery and then it moves on to how the practice of it and the subjugation of Africans continued even after abolition. It's incredible. You should watch that. But what I am going to do is give you an example of how the Irish were not the bottom rung of the ladder. Far from it. There's an event that happened in the late 1600s which I think illustrates this. In January 1692, a group of Irishmen were arrested for taking part in a rebellion plot. According to Beckles, quote, The strategy for obtaining arms was to send five or six Irishmen into Needham Fort to intoxicate the guards with strong drink and then unlock the stores. End quote. The outcome for the African slaves who took part in this plot is horrendous. Quote, 92 were executed, 4 died of castration, 14 of miscellaneous wounds, and 4 of unknown causes. End quote. There is no record regarding any trial or punishment of the Irishmen who took part in this plot. And look, if you know anything about Irish history, you know that we tend to have a habit of fighting the English. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of our thing. So the idea that this plot would have been planned and organised without the help of Irishmen seems incredibly unlikely to me. Well, actually, the, the Irish were directly involved. Five or six of them were supposed to get the guards drunk. And this plot probably would have had widespread support in the community. So all that leads me to wonder, personally, how much of the punishments doled out after this plot were to do with the lack of Irish involvement, and how much were to do with the Irish simply pointing the finger of blame at those who were lesser than them in the society that they were part of. With the increase of the number of chattel slaves in the colonies, the number of Irish reduced, as did the instances of conflict between the Irish and the English landowners. The reason for this is because now, a majority of the Irish who were in the colonies were not servants anymore. They were landowners themselves. As Beckles points out, quote, For the white community as a whole, such conflict gave way to the overriding task of keeping thousands of slaves in subjection. End quote. Okay, so I'm going to speak off the cuff here. Um, so the quality is going to go down. And the language is probably going to go up, but even so. Um, I mean, it, it, it seems to me, having gone through all this and having read all that I did read, <clears throat> excuse me, the treatment of Irish indentured servants was obviously cruel and awful. Um, actually, not just indentured servants, free men and women too, I should throw that in. It was cruel and it was awful, but I don't think that it was cruel and awful treatment because they were indentured servants or free men and women i think that they were treated in such a cruel way because that is the way the english wished that they were able to treat the irish in ireland i mean there are christ how how many examples of british cruelty and brutality against irish people throughout history 
but there's kind of always a how do I want to put this an acknowledgement that they need to be reserved about it to maintain an air of British civility um that basically make up reasons for being cruel that's that's essentially what I'm saying um so you know they don't they don't just they don't just gun down innocent people. Well, they did, but the reason for doing so is because those people were suspected combatants, like secret combatants, all that kind of stuff. Um, in a way, they were like the the modern forefathers of like the war crimes playbook, you know, like weapons of mass destruction, like you know that invasion, uh, like collateral damage, uh, having reasonable suspicion for holding people in Guantanamo Bay. These are acts of brutality, these are war crimes, but they're not portrayed that way. These aren't now just acts of brutality, these are acts of war. They are a, they are an action taken because the enemy is placing you under threat and you have to defend yourself. And it seems to me that in these colonies, the treatment of the Irish was was because it was remote, so now the, the, the gloves are off. They don't need to keep that pretense up anymore. They don't need to keep that air of British civility. They're free to literally, like literally in the most literal sense, beat the Irish without any need for pretense at all. So I hope I've made it clear that I'm not making it out like indentured servitude is a, I don't know, like a J1, a working holiday. You're not going to pick strawberries in a field for two weeks and then head off on your jollies to get shit-faced at the beach. That's not what this is. It was tough, and many people died. And the treatment of the Irish during this period is a travesty, and it should be rightly remembered and condemned. But history should not be overwritten. The continued pushing of the incorrect narrative that indentured servitude was as bad as, if not worse than slavery, is not only wrong, it's dangerous. To push a narrative like this not only allows those who wish to rewrite history to do so by simply continuing to push an agenda hard enough, it also makes it more difficult to hold them to account, to hold anyone to account, and, like it or not, it's going to help white supremacists push their viewpoint into the mainstream. But that's not even the most important part about this. Even more importantly, is that it diminishes the actual horrors of slavery. The true, unbelievable brutality of it all. A kind of brutality that's so extreme and beyond the realms of human comprehension that, within a generation or two, people begin to doubt whether it even happened that way in the first place, which is exactly what we're seeing now. It's vital that you keep this knowledge in the public sphere. These horrors, they're not enjoyable to talk about. It's fucking horrible to talk about them. But goddamn, we need to fucking remember. I used the term plastic patty earlier on at the start of the video. That's not a term I generally use. I don't, I don't like it. As far as I'm concerned, if you want to be Irish and you feel Irish, I am very happy to call you Irish. Passport or not. But... If you are going to use Irishness simply as a way of stepping on people who are currently being oppressed or who have been oppressed in the past, then you can fuck off. That's not the kind of Ireland we have now. That's not the kind of Ireland we want to continue having. And that's certainly not the kind of Ireland that a lot of our historically fallen heroes would have wanted to see. Quote, let none of the slave owners, dealers in human flesh, dare to set a foot upon our free soil. End quote. Daniel O'Connell said that, and I am very fucking confident that he'd feel the very same way about those who, today, are trying to lessen the crimes of the past. <laughs>